woken up. Two pretty um, people look about 25 years old, which clearly we are. Um, Peter Harley and myself. We also have Ben Gordon and Dan Hayes. We're all um, directors in the forensic section and, and doing the business valuation side of it as a specialty. Um, before I do, Peter, we've got to talk about. Um, Come on, I'm a bit rough on you, my you it up. joke last night, and I'm I was jokingly told these guys I'd say, but I'm not going to embarrass myself. What's your name? Peter's joke was. We thought we'd just kick it off. There's our name. Um, we'd like to go to this room. We're actually wearing a chair where we can see a crystal ball of those guys. A crystal ball of gazing at those guys. That example for us. <laughs> <laughs> the 11 year old thought my dad joked it in all material.
having this very early on. How much can I sell that to hundred thousand dollars without the Well if you're going to
that's really good. There's nothing else like it out there. Um, they've had a great location for the last 20 years, and their clients are really good to pay them on time, and you know, they never have any trouble or whatever. But if they don't make any money out of all that, for whatever reason, maybe they just don't charge, they could charge more for whatever reason, there's not going to be goodwill in a commercial sense that comes up. So as John was saying, it's all about the return and the risk involved. But you might have all those wonderful things, and the business might look fantastic, but if it's not producing a return, you're not going to end up with goodwill. The other things you've got to look at in the um, doing a valuation is not just the business itself, but also the general economic climate. So what's the consumer sentiment out there? Are people bullish or are they, are they expecting things, you know, probably a WA at the moment? Not real, not real good. Queensland was sort of in the middle, New South Wales and New South um, Victoria. I probably a little bit you know, you know, after a bit of a around Australia there's different economies running and then consumer sentiment. And you know, that even feeds through things like you know, our house prices going up at the moment, people are feeling good because they know their houses are increasing in value. Right, that's gonna be trying to sell a business in the client or the council.
Uh, then you get back to supply and demand, you know, and it's effect on prices. Um, what's the political environment? People always think election coming up, I think they give that as an excuse as well as this business going well. Um, finance, is it possible to get finance for these businesses? So um, we do a fair bit of valuation work for banks as well, as well as litigation ones. Um, 7 Eleven stores, well, overnight, you know, when they had the big couple about all the wages and so on, the banks just stopped lending on 7 Eleven stores. Um, that obviously would affect the market in terms of if you have a 7-Eleven and you want to sell, probably uh, half to two-thirds of your purchases just dropped out of the market because they didn't have the cash available to be able to move on. They might still want to buy one, but if you didn't have the several hundred thousand dollars typically to buy one, you, um, you wouldn't be able to because the bank wasn't going to, none of the banks were lending on them. I did a um, tax kid day, I put the mover down the other end of town and I called the taxi back. I've got a grumpy after my taxi driver was with him. And I said, hey, how's the taxi business going? And he was, was just potting a bear and really wide. Right. He said, oh, it's destroyed me. Um, I've just lost my house. I've done this. I've had a taxi license. was worth $150,000. Banks were lending on taxi licenses. Now the taxi license is worth nothing. The debt's still there. He's lost his house. Um, and he's well, I said, a diabetes and couldn't get his um, a doctor's appointment in time because we were cancelled by that um, by the bank a couple of weeks ago. And he did his taxi license, his, his driver's license at home. Um, but in a couple of months, that's what happened to that business. And again, the environment there, is adding that sort of extra level, um, the risk of business is there anything else and how can you use this to kind of identify risk? Um, and just the outlook generally. So all those sort of things need to be taken into account in the background of, of when you're looking at the, um, the business. It's not just a matter of looking at the profit and loss statement, the balance sheet of the business in question. You've got to consider all those other factors that are going to affect the business one way or another. What is being valued? Something that people often get confused about. They think, I want to, I want to value the business, but what you really have is a shareholders dispute. So what you really need to do is value the entity and then you need to value their interest and maybe one or both of the shareholders, if there's two of them, have lent some money in. So if one of them's going to exit, they'll want their share value plus they'll want their loan back. So um, it's not just a matter of valuing the business, that's the starting point. That then drops into the entity, where it's the company, the trust, the partnership, whatever it is. And you've got to work out what their interest is. Maybe they've only got a 15% interest in the whole thing. And we'll talk about minority interest discounts and things a bit later on as to how that might affect things. Any questions at that point? People are racing through this. We'll slow down a little bit later when we get to the example. Um, we'll also talk about a few things that have been addressed in the last event. We'll talk about a few of the things. The going concern assumption is something that is, is usually completely overlooked. Um, we go in, we look at the actual numbers that are there, all that there's a problem, and therefore it must go But there's so many other factors that come into this. Uh, it's quite common for a startup business to cost three and five years to get that right before it gets sold. Why? Uh, because that three to five years they're starting to get more compassionate, but as they grow, they've got to fund their work. Head of the ground, the soft guy, the working progress guy, the need more capital for venture, they give you opportunity for money when you make investments. Um, so, from a point of view of, they're still profitable, but they can't fund their business. So, from a going concern point of view, is the business going concern? Yes. Is the entity going concern? No. What's the actual stuff with all the instructions and actually doing the valuation? Um, what happens if they're doing quite well, but one of their debts is still broke? Um, they can no longer fund what's going on. They're not going to pay it. They don't have the actual funds to pay that. Although on paper they're trading really well, the reality is, from a commercial viewpoint, they can't afford to trade. And that is a story we see a hell of a lot. If a business is trading at a loss, it's got to fund those losses. Where's the money?
money is going to come from to actually fund those losses. So yes, it has a great history, but the study is all about the future. From that point of view, if you're just making losses, how are you going to fund those losses? And how is it actually going to get out of this problem? And at the moment, we're seeing a lot of that. There's a lot of businesses really struggling out there, particularly retail businesses. Evaluation methodologies. Evaluation methodologies tend to fall into three primary categories. You've got the earnings based methodology, and look at the that, that second definition we looked at. They look at the um, uh, profit or cash flow coming through the investment, taking into account the risk of success. You've got the asset based methodologies where you're looking at the underlying assets and liabilities. So you look at the balance sheet. What are the assets and liabilities? Third category is really everything else. All that um, those other methodologies. You've got industry approaches and rules, rules and stuff. Um, and there are certain industries that um, have their own methodology for actually value. So accountancy practices where they turn over less than five hundred thousand dollars, they tend to sell for anything from eighty cents to a dollar twenty of the actual repairing price. So dollar is a five hundred thousand dollar client base. That client base. That actually is their rent on work, their financial on financial time. There are a few businesses that have been that much transactions that actually happen, have their own approach. But the way they actually work um, primarily relates to the actual uh, base that's there. So for a accountancy practice, the reason the $500,000 or less accountancy practice sells for that type of work is the larger practice. Either, either restructuring it with some people, or I can go and find the client base and swap this by existing infrastructure um, to fill the hole, and I can actually make synergies out of that because I've already got the infrastructure to run. So I'll actually go and buy a client base and keep it in mind. For me, it's worth that. Um, the reality is, quite often, though, these rules of thumb overvalue the business and the intrinsic value of the business as well. But typically, they based on sales, not the profit. So it ignores the total cost structure. And in John's example there, they're really just assuming they go out and buy a $200,000 client portfolio. They'll just add $200,000 to their own revenue, but really have no extra rent, no extra wages. They've got a few extra staff work, make the staff work a bit harder. And that's the only way the value is typically. And that's going to be a good part of it. Running that as a zone isolated business, that's the problem. Uh, and one thing that where that stuff with sales does come out is it's a bit of a 
only getting a fifty thousand dollar profit out of it. It's only a twenty five percent return. We're saying he should get a thirty three percent return for the risk. If he's not getting the appropriate level of return, the rational investor should sell. In practice they never will. As long as that number at the top is positive, most people will still keep running the business. It's still a going concern, it's not about the kicking the bucket or going to liquidation or anything, but um, it's not getting an appropriate rate of return so there's no goodwill. So quickly, so I think John mentioned most of this earlier, but just be aware, you know, should tax and realisation costs come into it? And if you've got a business that you question is a going concern, things like stock, you might have to discount the value of the 20 to 30 percent. Actually, um, a business interruption claim this week for a menswear store that had a the place next door actually had a big fire and the smoke infiltrated all the stock. As it turned out, they spent thirty grand. They had one and a half million dollars of stock, and they had to cost them about thirty grand to dry clean it all, and it ended up being okay. But their policy said if there was damage, which the smoke infiltration qualified as damage under their industrial special risk policy, the insurance company had to pay them out their cost of the stock, so they got a cheque for one and a half million dollars. Then the insurance company said, right, we own all this mentally stock, what are we going to do with it? Oh, so the loss adjuster said, well, if we put it to auction, I reckon you'll get not a 20 or 30 percent discount, you'll actually get about 20 or 30 percent of what it costs. So they said, okay, so it's worth that two or three hundred grand, okay. So the men's wear store said, we'll buy it for 225, <laughs> spent 30 grand on dry cleaning and sold it for two and a half mil. So they basically bought their stock, sold it for the same price, bought it again at a substantial discount, and then just sold it in the normal course of business. But that was just the way their policy worked. But now they're trying to sue the place next door for their losses. And I'm saying, well, no, you've actually come out a million bucks better off. And they just can't see it. So, well, but that happens. But the, the stock discount might be even greater than 20 or 30%. That's just a sort of a normal sort of thing. Um, and equipment. 10% goodwill, you know, if, if you, that could be up to 100% discount once you've got a business that's not going to serve the goodwill might disappear. And you've got wind up costs. Sorry, the 10% is probably a realisation cost. If you're selling a business, that's probably what you've got to pay a broker. So if you sell your house, you pay 2.5%. Um, if you sell a business, it's probably more like 10%. Um, should tax be considered? So you've brought, you notice on the balance sheet, work in progress isn't there. But bring it to account, should you take into account that when you do convert that work in progress into debtors, you'll have to pay tax on it? The answer is probably yes. Uh, John gave the example, you know, plant equipment might have actually gone up in value. It doesn't matter if you're to buy properties, goodwill, all those things, should you factor in some sort of tax allowance if they've gone up in value compared to their original cost? Yeah, and reflecting that there is a capital gains tax liability that will have to be paid at some time. The other question then becomes though, Maybe that tax liability won't crystallise for 10 years. So what do you do with it then? Do you discount it back? Do you just take it? These are all, there's no one answer to it all. It depends on the circumstance of the valuation. It's just things the valuer should consider. So minority interest, interest. anyone else has heard that term? I'm across it now, a few nods yet. So should, if you own less than 100%, should you pay less than the proportional value is really what it is. Is there a greater risk if you own less than 100%? So normally this comes into the discounts for lack of control and lack of liquidity. So if you're looking at control, between the Corp Act and most um, stock standard company constitutions, you've got 75 to 99% you've got statutory control. So you can pass risk special resolutions, you can do all that sort of stuff. 51 to 74, you can probably pass ordinary resolutions and you have effective control. At 50%, two at 50 50%, you've shared your control, you're both in the same boat. 20 to 49, you might only have 20%, but if the other 80% is owned by 10 people who each only have 8%, you might have effective control, you know, because you're the main shareholder, you founded the business, you brought in some other staff and so on who really still think of you as the boss and they always defer to you, and you've got what I'm sure will be day to day control. You're the one the other day we asked them about the shareholders. They either had a meeting or they ever had a vote. Yeah. Um, five shareholders only five percent to 
the IT needs to be not right. And if you ever had a bug, you can actually look at what it looks like if you had 33% if you've got 33% of bugs. Have you ever done that? Like I said, never once. I mean, have you actually ever voted on one? The yes was voted, it was always beaten out. But 18 years, it's a lot of very different personalities. They've always physically have actually approached it in the same way. So although you've got a five percent and the reality is that's probably not. Well, no. So, well, there's certainly not a discount for lack of control because everyone seems to have an equal say. This is something that it's people around the table, and although some of them like 30% or some five, they all count as equal votes in the practice or reality of, the, of how the business was run. And then the other one I mentioned before is liquidity, you know, where what have you what is the market? Is there even a market? Um, so if you're one of those eight percent people that I just mentioned, then you've got who's going to buy your eight percent? You're not going to be a seller out of the open market. It's going to be another employee coming through or something like that. So is there a discount for that? Well, it may be that you've actually got a easy to sell eight percent of the percent of the business that you might have got a bit of money in because it's something you can buy. And even something like 18, I think we've got. <laughs> so roughly, you know, if you say the average person got five percent, it's a lot easier to sell a little five percent share of an accounting or legal practice than to sell the whole thing. Um, so it's actually yeah easier. There's not many people who are out there buying you know, multi-million dollar turnover accounting practices. <laughs> Any professional practice for that for that matter, because um, for some reason professional practices just don't seem to work very well. Do they? Most of the owners work in them and run them. There's been a few, you know, there's a couple of little bits of legals that aren't doing too well and there's a whole uh, litany of businesses and accounting <laughs> that have well and truly crashed. A couple of examples. So any questions before I get into a couple of, we've already told a few examples and sort of in the middle, we'll just do a couple just to sort of illustrate how earnings can affect value and so on. So has anyone got any questions? Okay, so business number one. John, do you want to? This is actually one of John's cases. John's job, so you want to talk about it? The first one, business thoughts in the construction industry, which is understanding where a business is not a business. It's not having the same background as that business. So it's in the construction industry. Um, South East Queensland also outside that the uh, South East Queensland and the state. Um, sorry. Trading performance there. 2013 to 16, you can see it's gone from 12 million, 7 million, 5 million to 7 million. So we've come down and then up. Profitability wise, it's changed dramatically. 2.7 down to 100 up to 830, but after putting through normalisation adjustments, it's actually gone from 2.4 million down to a loss of 10,000, and this year, 650. So can we approach valuation here? And, and can I say, this sort of wild fluctuation, 10 years ago, I hardly ever used to see that. You can see businesses are just plugging along nicely. This is probably more than normal these days. You used to always say, I'll just take the last three years and average them and you know, multiply them by the, the capitalization rate. That used to be the back of the envelope sort of valuation methodology 10 years ago, and you just can't anymore because normal businesses have these big fluctuations in both income and in profit. Keep in mind, any business valuation we're initially looking at, what's it doing going forward? Future of this business. So we've got four years and four different years on. Um, the important thing here to point out is it's a construction business and a large contract construction business. They tend to thin those, those contract runs for six, six months to a year. So you can imagine at this point here, what is the future going to be? What are you look at? What contracts have you got? Where are you at? What have been the range in your contracts? Why did that just happen? The expectation of what's going on. Another thing that's important, Peter went through earlier, the economic climate. What's the um, government doing in relation to this capital work? Is this business is primarily doing government type work? We saw that a couple of years ago with the, the schools, with the halls being built. The school could actually build what it was, $2.6 million hall. Every school did it. And then followed 
construction people came in and said, happy day, we'll build your hall. We'll build your little Atco shed for you. Then that ended. Not all those people doing it. So you start seeing wild fluctuation in trading floors. So the question before, how do you approach the valuation? We're looking forward. We're, in this case here, we actually looked at the fire capitalization. We use a maintained learning for 150,000. As it turned out, based on the contracts that are there and the way it was traded, the 2016 result looks fairly represented what's going forward and it matched their forecast by 50 dollars We adopted the 650 FME. Capitalization rate came in 27.5, based on which is for construction industry, the three um, for that size construction business, um, but to reflect what the contract had had. Capitalized value. Expenses divided by 27.5 came to 2.4 million. Net tangible business assets, all the equipment, stock, the work in progress um, that they had in place, the debtors that were in the same, the cash they had to hold, um, most of the creditors came to $1.8 million. So the goodwill to this business is 530000 um, Payback period about 10 months. So in that case, there, you're dividing 530000 divided by 650. So based on the earnings coming through, how long will it take for you to reach this? Overnight, if your business changes, so how long is that timeline you're looking at? So, before tax dollars, um, 10 months after tax dollars. Um, so I remember back really early on, we said, you know, what goodwill is and, is and isn't. You'd look at this and think, oh, I've got a, you know, this is a big business, it's turning over seven, five, twelve million dollars. It must have a lot of goodwill, surely. A lot of people people think that, a lot of clients, it's got a lot of turnover, it'll have a lot of goodwill. That's interesting. The year before, it made a loss. It still had good So it's all about what the future is going to be. But if we were valuing it back here, what would we have done? Same process. You've got to try and get. So we don't know any of this. We're not looking back in hindsight. We're actually sitting here in July 2013 and saying, you've still got to say, Look at those forward contracts, look at the tenders they've won, look at all that stuff, so same, same thing. You can see here why it's so important to look forward, not back. If you'd actually take an average of the last three years, which is when you see that the next session we hold is that fifth fall of evaluation, a lot of the accounts will just average the last three years. Is that representative of what the business is really going forward? And because of the contracts and the like, we would actually find the business to work out. Next time we have a franchise, this is actually one of the ones I was talking about earlier. We're at a franchise restaurant, five year lease, currently making offers of 30,000 per annum on sit out and infrastructure of 500,000 per annum. That is, if you buy this business, you're buying that. How much did you pay for this business itself? Which is a really good way of looking at what this is worth. How much did you pay for it? Half a million dollars worth of book value in your assets. What are you getting for that half a million dollars? A loss of thirty thousand dollars a year. How much would you pay to incur a loss of thirty thousand dollars a year? Which is worse than that, because you're at a five year lease. You just lose that, that thirty thousand unless you can turn it around. That's the best information you have now. So a thirty thousand dollar loss a year for the next five years. And then you find another tenant to take your place. And don't forget you've also got the majority of your 500000 is equipped from the fit-out, which in five years' time, you'll probably have to spend again because Westfield will say you've got to do a refurb if you want a new lease, or maybe your franchise all will say you've got to do a refurb. If not a full refurb, you might have to spend 100 or 200 So you've got to factor that in as well, that in five years' time, I'll have to factor it. If I want to keep this business going after five-year lease, maybe I've got to spend another two or 300000 on Last one is this is a, a family law case, which we see a few ones like this where this guy's actually a carpet layer, basically, but for luxury yachts on the Gold Coast. So I guess who the got a lot of them. Got a lot of them. <laughs> so, um, and I actually did this one a few years ago, and it had just been after the GFC, and the luxury yacht maker hadn't been selling a lot of yachts. Um, back in the good.
good years, and it was but it was coming back. It, was, uh, it had a couple of years where it basically didn't make much money at all because he sent a bit to carpet from our yacht. Then he had two or three years where he's actually making five hundred thousand dollars a year. And one bloke with about two or three employees, and all they were doing was laying carpet. Not no contracts. No contracts. One customer and a manufacturer. Um, you've probably got to wonder, well, why wouldn't the yacht manufacturer just employ him on a, you know, he was paying his guys at 70 grand a year, and his skills weren't anything greater than that, so why wouldn't the yacht, for some reason, they just decide to contract out to this guy, I don't know why, but why would they just put him on the payroll and pop him over 430000 themselves? That's for a personality, and that's your view. It's not true, that's not value, but the value question is, No one will lose itself. Yeah, they don't But then you say, well, how long is he going to keep? And then the question is, how long is that income stream going to keep going for? It's still the same sort of process you go through in value in the business and assuming there's a market. That's actually financial work. It's all assessed by the income. That's where we're going now. And you can still value it up. You've got to try to assess the risk of what's going to happen. So it's not a market value. That one didn't actually go to court. I did have a very similar sort of one that did go to court years ago. But, uh, same sort of thing. And I was actually the fourth valuer involved. <laughs> Some of the other guys were poor joint experts, so that's how long ago it was. Husband had a valuer, wife had a valuer, so they were, as you can guess, with that sort of scenario, yeah. The husband's saying it's not worth anything, it's worth zero, because I can't sell it. Wife's saying, I've got a, you've got a four hundred thirty thousand dollar income stream per year. That's got to be worth you know, four or five times that because what, how he actually valued it wasn't so. Well, you're only 52 years old, you've got another 10 year life expectancy, um, work life expectancy. So I'm assuming it's going to keep going for another 10 years with reasonable certainty. So they end up with a value of about three or four million dollars. And then um, there was a joint expert involved who said, no, I think it's just a 33% cap rate. I think you just assume it's just like a small business. That and then the judge said, No, I don't believe any of them, uh, believe someone else. So then I got the key. And I said, I think it's just a financial resource, it's really just like a salary to bring it in as a 39 2 factor. And um, yeah, Ben Bowman, it was back then, said, No, I think I'll go with this three times and they did three, three years worth of profit. Now you never know sometimes the judges think, Well, I, I need to you know, sort of mold it. Obviously, making a fair bit of money, and they built up a pool. So, trying to even things out, sometimes they sort of massage the pan and they have a bit of to try and come up with the result they want and end up with a pool. And that's why that's just not my experience how they do it. You never know, though. But the call on a financial resource wasn't going to probably get him the result he wanted to in terms of what he thought, and the overall structure of the case wasn't adjusted and fair and equitable result, I suppose. That's possible. That's part of the reason when you look at judgments sometimes, you say, well, the judge in this case did this or that. And especially if you look at minority interest cases in the family court, they have, you know, the, the values range from 0% to 80%. Yeah. And you can get most questions. Yeah. You just say, well, is that the only evidence in front of them at the same time? You just don't know. You know was a legal expert who said it was 80%, so the judge just agreed. And, uh, in a commercial speech, you're probably going to get a bit more of a, a butting of heads and, and the right answer come out. And a, a commercial negotiation probably. Well, yeah. Well, yeah, and again, I have, I've had one like that in um, maybe a family court matter where it's a large money case where I said it was worth Joe Box and Grant Thornton said it was worth 40 million. The only other asset they had was. Thank you. 